Thank you, Jeremy. And it's nice to be with you all <clears throat> for your conference in Derry. As Jeremy says, it would be nice to be with you in person down in Wales. Uh, a long drive for us from here, but it would be nice to be with you. But uh, we do appreciate the exercise of the Assembly and the Brethren at Gospel Wales to facilitate this conference virtually. We do appreciate that and we trust that the Lord will bless us. It's good to be with um, good friend Eric Bagel as well, ensuring the conference this evening. Now, before we come to look at some of the activities uh, of the Lord's Work Trust, some of you will be very aware of them, others will not be, uh, so you can bear that in mind when we come to it. But just before we do that, uh, let's turn to the Word of God and 1 Corinthians chapter 15. <clears throat> Particularly on this Easter weekend, a very appropriate chapter, I think, to read just a few verses from and make a few brief comments before we uh, share a presentation with you. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. First of all, reading verse number 3. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which also I received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. And down to verse number 57, please. <clears throat> but thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labour is not in vain in the Lord. And then over to chapter 16, please, in verse number 9. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 9. For a great door and effectual is opened unto me, and there are many adversaries. Now if Timotheus come, See that he may be with you without fear, for he worketh the work of the Lord, as I also do. And as always, we look to the Lord for his help as we consider briefly these verses together. As I say, very apt and appropriate uh, this Easter weekend. I think we'll see a, a double connection between the latter verses of chapter 15 and the verses that were read in chapter number 16. Of course, there's a similar expression found here, only twice that it's found in our New Testament and within the confines of 10 verses at the end of 1 Corinthians. Verse 58, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And that's what we're going to be thinking about just in a moment or two, the Lord's work, trust. And then down in verse number 10 of chapter 16, for he worketh, in relation to Timothy, he worketh the work of the Lord, as I also do. So the expression is similar, but I'd suggest it goes beyond that, that the exhortation is very similar as well in these two sections of Scripture. Notice the words, notice the language that the Apostle uses. He talks about working, and he talks about labouring, and he talks about doing. I think it's the ESV that talks about Timothy doing the work, as Paul was also doing. We hear we're individuals and they're engaged in the work of the Lord. And we'll think about dear brother and sisters, and it's our joy to be associated with them in a little way, as in different parts of this world, even presently, and sometimes in very difficult, trying circumstances, they're involved actively, passionately in the work of the Lord. But it's important to see the context, as always, in these verses. We know that what Paul has just completed is one of the greatest doctrinal sections in our New Testament, as he deals with the doctrine of the resurrection in great detail. The first 11 verses, he'll deal with the reality of resurrection. Paul preached it. He loved to preach it. And I'm sure we do as well. Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. And he was buried, and he rose again triumphantly according to the Scriptures. So Paul preached it. The reality of it. Scripture prophesied it. Go back to Isaiah 700 years previous, and Isaiah will prophesy these great monumental events that were to take place in the future in relation to the Lord Jesus going to that cross and dying. Paul preached it. The scriptures prophesied about witnesses proved it. A variety of witnesses are presented. Peter, 
12, 500 million, James, Paul himself. Undeniable that the Lord Jesus rose from the dead. The reality of resurrection, and he deals with it at the start. And then that next little section, he deals with the necessity of resurrection. It's imperative that the Lord Jesus was raised from the dead. He deals with that in verses 12 to 19. Because if he hadn't, there's no saviour for sinners. And there's no salvation from sin. So we learn in this section that resurrection is absolutely central to our faith and is absolutely crucial to our future. And he deals with there the necessity of resurrection. Then in the next little section, as he deals and expands in this wonderful section of doctrine, verses 20 to 34, the certainty of resurrection. Notice how he starts. But now is Christ risen. Wonderful, isn't it? Now is Christ risen. In fact, that whole section is all about certainty. Notice further down in verse 25, for he must reign. No doubt about it. No ambiguity about it. And Paul there is dealing with the absolute certainty of the resurrection. The reality and the necessity and the certainty. And then in verses 35 to 49, the superiority of the resurrection, far greater than anything else. From corruption, sown in corruption, raised in incorruption, verse 42. Sown in dishonour, raised in glory. Sown in weakness, raised in power. Sown a natural body, raised a spiritual body, the superiority of the resurrection. And this, of course, is now changed to dealing not so much with the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, that's those first three sections, but he's now dealing with the resurrection of the believers. And he's saying it's superior, the superior to the resurrection. And then just before he comes to this verses, these verses that we've read, he's dealing with the victory of the resurrection. Wonderful. Notice three times over. Uh, we didn't read the first two. Verse number 54, he talks about death is swallowed up in victory. Verse 55, where is thy victory? O grave, where is thy victory? And then, of course, we read in verse 17, but thanks be to God which giveth us the victory. And he concludes that doctrinal section. The reality, the necessity, the certainty, now is Christ risen. The superiority and the victory of the resurrection. What a transformation in the lives of the believers. And it's a wonderful victory. And that's why he then brings that to a conclusion and says, therefore, there's the link, of course, isn't it, to the verses that we read. He's now moving from doctrine to practice. And, of course, we know in Scripture, we've often been taught that these two are really inextricably linked. The doctrine that's contained within the Word of God and the practice, the doing of it, and that's what Paul is really emphasizing in these two expressions. It's the work of the Lord. And how thrilling to think of believers, men and women, young and some very, very old, and they're engaged passionately in the work of the Lord. They're doing it. They're involved in it. They're active in it. And now within the compass of these few verses, as he deals with the practice of doing the work of the Lord. He'll explain how we should do it. And I just want to leave this before we come to look at the report. How should we do the work of the Lord? You know, it's been a great privilege for me in the last year, year and a half of being involved in a fuller way uh, in interacting with some of these missionaries. And all of these attributes are seen in these brethren and sisters that are engaged at home and abroad in the work of the Lord. First of all, Paul suggests that we should be doing the work of the Lord appealingly. We have that in verse number 50. He says, therefore, my beloved brethren. What an appeal from the apostle. In spite of the shortcomings of the Corinthians, it must have caused some great grief of heart betimes. And yet, there's a warmth, there's an appeal, there's an affection. Remember in Philippians chapter 4, he'll say there, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for. Paul had a heart, the apostle had a great heart for his fellow believers, as he had a heart for the unsaved. And here, he says, in doing the work of the Lord, we ought to do it appealingly. And he does that. My beloved brethren. But then he says, secondly, do it scripturally. 
I would take that from that link there, just that link word there for linking back to the doctrinal section. In light of the truth of the resurrection, we read in verses 3 and 4, those two references to according to the scriptures, according to the scriptures. You know, Paul, he had a love for the Lord. We'll see that further down. It's the work of the Lord. That's what captivated him in Acts chapter 9. That's what motivated him. He had a love for the Lord. He had a love for the scriptures. He had a love for the book. He had a love for doctrine and the teaching of the word of God. And of course, he had a love for the saints and a love for the sinners as well. He had a large part. But he's saying in doing the work of the Lord, practically, we ought to do it appealingly. And we ought to do it scripturally, according to the scriptures. I mean, then thirdly, says we ought to do it resolutely. Two little expressions there in verses 58. He says, be steadfast. And secondly, he says, be unmovable. Perhaps one is in relation to turning aside personally. So the appeal goes out, don't allow anything within us to deflect us from the work of the Lord. Have a fixed purpose and do the work of the Lord resolutely, not being turned aside easily. And but then secondly, says not only is there a danger that we move, but there's a danger that others might, through their influence, move us. So not so much internal, but external events and circumstances. And he deals with that as well, I would suggest. And he says, be resolute, not only within, to be steadfast, to have that fixed purpose, but be unmovable. Be firmly persistent. Let nothing else move you. Let no one else move you. He says, we ought to be resolute in the work of the Lord. How challenging, how practical, just after this great doctrinal section, as he brings this lovely epistle to a close, he's saying we ought to do the work of the Lord, but we ought to do it appealingly and scripturally and resolutely. I mean, he says more than that, let's do it energetically, always abounding. Paul seemed to have endless energy, didn't he? Remember Philippians chapter 3, I press towards the mark, I strain every sinew for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. The Old Testament equivalent, of course, would be Caleb. Remember, as an old man, and there he's standing, he's looking up at the mountain, and he's saying, give me this mountain. The energy of an old man, not settling down and saying, well, we'll leave it to others now, but still engaged, still active, still involved. We'll think a little bit about that from an example from many, many years ago, just in a moment or two. But she says, let's be energetic. Remember in 1 Thessalonians 4, twice over with that, that expression, more and more. Same thought. Increasing more and more. In loving one another. He says, it ought to be more and more. We ought to be abounding in love to one another. And in pleasing God, he'll deal with that in verse number 10. As walking so as to please God, we ought to abound more and more. More and more. So there should be that energy as we seek to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And we'll think something about that just in a moment or two. And then he says, we ought to do it prospectively as well. Your labor is not in vain in the Lord. He said, it's not meaningless. It's not futile. Remember back in the same epistle, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, you'll talk there about the judgment seat of Christ and building in the gold and the silver and the precious stones. Things that are of immense and eternal value, but are often in very small quantities, can be sitting in your pocket, nobody knows. And just you think of the deeds of the saints, and the vast majority unknown to us, but recognized in heaven, and one day will be rewarded in heaven. Your labor is not in vain in the Lord. We trust that will be an encouragement to us all. He says, let's do it prospectively. Do it devotedly because it is the work of the Lord. That transforms our service, surely. It's not mundane. It's not ordinary. It's not secular. But surely, as we think of the work of the Lord, both here and in chapter 16, it elevates the work, doesn't it? 
it consecrates the work. It prioritizes the work. And our response ought to be to do it diligently and reverently and willingly as these servants of the Lord that we'll be thinking about undoubtedly do. And then finally, seventhly, as you're thinking of this thought of practically doing the work of the Lord, it's active. Is do it appealingly and scripturally and resolutely. Do it energetically and prospectively. Do it devotedly, but he concludes by thinking in chapter 60, he says, do it unitedly. There was just a danger as Timothy was coming. Timothy's visit had been announced in chapter 4 of the epistle. And now he's saying when he comes, it will come without fear. One translation says, see that you put him at ease, for he is doing the work. Of the Lord. There would be those perhaps who'd have been critical, perhaps those who would have looked askance at the younger man, and he wants Timothy's visit to be peaceful, and he wants it to be unity amongst the Lord's people, because surely that's where the blessing will result. So practical exhortations after this great section of doctrine, and on this Easter weekend as we think of the wonderful truth of Christ being raised from the dead triumphantly, it's incumbent upon us in the days that lie ahead until the Lord Jesus come again, that we are all actively involved, whether in a full-time capacity, so-called, or not, because we're really all full-time, surely, that we do the work of the Lord energetically and devotedly and scripturally and unitedly. We do trust the Lord to bless these few thoughts from this section at the end of 1 Corinthians. Now, I'm going to share... The screen, hopefully this is going to work. This is always where my heart misses a beat as technology takes over. I trust that you can all see that. Yep, I'm getting a thumbs up, so that's good. <clears throat> now, I understand that the, the, the chat facility uh, is available, so if there are any questions en route that you might have, you can put them down or you can store them at the end or you can email them to Jeremy and I'm sure we can try and address any questions or queries that we don't cover on the way through. So I've been involved directly in the, in the Lord's Work Trust for about a year and a half or thereabouts. Um, now, of course, a large part of that has been um, affected by uh, the coronavirus. Uh, we'll talk about that later on. Um, but the Lord has been very gracious throughout and the activity the, of the Lord's Work Trust has really continued in many ways unaffected, for which we're very, very grateful. Now, I know that uh, things have eased a little bit in Wales. You're now allowed to move around in Wales a lot more freely, which is, I'm sure, a great relief for many of you. But uh, unfortunately, you're not able to travel up to Scotland at the moment. So um, what I thought we would do is we would just have a, a quick tour virtually. You can't do it actively, but we'll little do a little tour virtually. Um, and uh, of course, it's really a tartan tour. You're moving north of the border. And we're just going to think about uh, where we uh, operate from. And then we'll look at some of the work that was on there. So the Lord's Work Trust virtually. Maybe you're asking questions, why would, why would we need to leave Wales? But I heard last, last weekend one of your countrymen, he was reminding us of course of that verse in the very first chapter of the Bible, Genesis 1, verse, I think it's 21, God made great Wales. And uh, I wouldn't disagree with that. Um, of course he made great Scotland as well, and we'll see some pictures of that shortly, but virtually, if you were to travel north you could eventually get to Kilmarnock. And there you'll find the Lord's Work Trust up the stairs in that building. It's been there for many years. And down the stairs, as you can see from the sign, you've got John Rich's Limited. And I'm sure many of you will be aware already that John Rich's Limited is a subsidiary. It's owned by the Lord's Work Trust. Um, a lot of the staff are unique to both of the organizations and there are some that do bridge across the two 
organizations. But there they are. And of course, again, inextricably linked because um, John Richard Lumet to the publisher of Christian material and same literature. And um, we'll talk a little bit about that later on, how that right from the setting up of the Lord's Work Trust, it was, uh, the vision was that good quality literature would be sent across the world uh, to people who uh, perhaps couldn't afford it, but for which it would be very beneficial to them. So Rich has continued to do that in producing that literature, and we continue to send it out regularly from the trust to the different parts of the world. So that's the two areas of the trust. Now, moving inside, um, as I say, COVID has really had quite an impact. So uh, most of the offices have been empty, certainly my office and the boardroom have been empty, but that doesn't mean, as I said, that things aren't happening. Because um, the ladies who work there, although they're camera shy, so we don't have their picture, um, they're really the reason why LWT has continued during the last year. And it's them that really do make Lords Work Trust tick. And we'll mention them by name just shortly as well. Again, just if you move around offices, not now Great Wales, but Great Scotland. Um, but it's not just nice pictures on the wall, of course, and maps. You have to have a map. Um, so there's a few of them in the office. But we've mentioned the importance of scripture, and I think that text is on two walls in the office. And it really was a verse that was integral in the very commencement of the trust many, many years ago. And it just epitomizes and summarizes the activity of the trust, striving together, Philippians 1, for the faith and the furtherance and the fellowship of the gospel. We know that in that chapter, Paul has a lot to say about the gospel. And of course, the enemies of the Lord Jesus and the enemies of the cross of Christ would have been delighted when they found that Paul was in prison. And they would have assumed that his incarceration meant that the forward progress of Christianity would have come to a shuddering halt. But of course, that wasn't the case. And the work of the Lord continued unabated and unrestricted, even though Paul was in prison. And it was for the furtherance and the fellowship of the gospel. So that's the Lord's work trust virtually. You can maybe just picture it in your mind now where, uh, where it is in Kilmarnock. But I thought maybe we would just, and I've alluded to this already, historically, when did it start? What brought it all about? Well, we're going back a long time, obviously. Um, over 120 years ago, um, John Ritchie himself, um, born in the north of Scotland in Meldrum, and saved in Inverurie. And he then married and moved south to Ayrshire as a relative young man. And here was John Ritchie, and he, he loved witnessing. He was one of those individuals just who loved telling others about the Saviour. And people who knew him reported that he was a person who was very good at organizing. He was a born organizer. I'm not, and uh, maybe, maybe you are, but I certainly am. But he loved working and he loved witnessing, but he loved writing as well. And he especially loved encouraging younger believers. That was John Ritchie. Over 200 volumes, books and booklets have come from his pen. Some of you will have them on your bookshelf. A book on the tabernacle, a book on Egypt to Canaan. And they're very readable and very helpful. And that was John Ritchie all these years ago. But how did the Lord's Work Trust come to be, be about? Well, he was looking at the believers' magazines, the early believers' magazines, and as he read the reports, and some of them are fascinating, that really prompted him to set up the Lord's Work Trust. Now, I've got an old one here. It's volume number six, um, and it's dated, and I'm just looking at it here, 1896. I just want to read a couple of extracts from it that you might find useful because it might have been this 
Berry book or something similar that John Ritchie was reading that brought about the commencement of the Lord's Work Trust. He says this, Gospel meetings have been held in a schoolroom in the Black Isle, Invernessure, by brethren from Manchester and Kilmarnock on holiday there. I thought that was interesting. They were on holiday. Travelled up from Manchester on holiday, but they had gospel meetings there in the Black Isle. Then he says, our aged brother, Donald Ross, has visited the city of Aberdeen and many places in the counties of Banff, Murray and Aberdeen, where in former years he had laboured for the Lord with others. And then it adds, he is still fresh and vigorous. That takes us back to the energy of a Caleb and the energy of the apostle and the energy of many of these servants of the Lord today. And they're in their late 80s and the early 90s and they're still working diligently. As this dear brother, Mr. Ross, was as well. He is still fresh and vigorous. Then it comes down, and this may be of more interest to you. John Prothero has been working amongst villages of the Rhonda Valley with his gospel van and found an open ear for the gospel and the truth of God. Several were baptized at Pontypridd, where a conference was held on August the 3rd. There is a great field for work in these Welsh valleys. It's not just UK based, and I think this is what really stimulated um, Brother Ritchie. It talks here about people leaving Ayrshire for Johannesburg, miners and others. May their spiritual life flourish there. What an interesting addition. Then it talks about Mr. McClure and a Mr. Moneypenny having been preaching in a tent in Los Angeles, 1896. And it talks about brethren and their preaching in Australia and New Zealand, Brisbane, and so on. Prayer is asked for a real revival in these parts. And every month these reports were coming through and John Ritchie decided to get involved practically in helping the work of the Lord all those years ago, prompted by the missionary reports and the work of the Lord being recounted in the magazine in the 1890s. So that's when it started. It's important just to stress that the Lord's Work Trust doesn't have any control and exert any control over the Lord's servants. The Lord's servants are called by the Lord himself and they go out in faith and they're commended by their own local assembly and there is no control whatsoever exerted on them by the Lord's Work Trust. We don't interfere in their work. We say they're responsible to the Lord and to the assembly that commended them. We do work closely with them, of course, and we can, if asked, give advice, but it is the Lord who guides and directs in this great harvest field. That's the Lord's Work Trust historically. I want you to spend a bit of time thinking about the Lord's Work Trust practically. And we'll come back to that picture of those letters just in a moment or two. Just keep that in your mind. But practically. So, of course, one of the things that we do is we channel. Can I just move this just so I can see the bullet points? That's helpful. Uh, we channel funds. So, that's one of the prime reasons. And the kind of activities of the Lord's Work Trust is that we channel funds, brethren and sisters, they send funds into uh, LWT and then we channel them so they earmark them. Um, they're restricted funds, as we call them. We'll talk about that just in a moment or two. Uh, they're earmarked for a particular project or a particular work, and we then channel those funds and we forward those gifts. We communicate, and again, we'll think about that just in a moment or two. We communicate with these servants and do so and try to encourage them in the process. Many of them working in very deprived areas and difficult areas. And relatively speaking, things are very easy for us. But for many of them, there is significant deprivation and difficulty and hostility. And we do seek to help them and encourage them 
through communication. And of course, prayer. It's wonderful just to support these brothers and sisters in prayer as well as practically. And then we publish, and we'll talk about that just in a moment or two. These are the activities that we're currently involved in. And as I mentioned earlier, we make literature available. And increasingly we do that. It's been done in the past quite a bit, but we do see that increasingly that will be something that we, we do uh, to make good quality literature available in uh, significant quantities um, and guided by the Lord's servants as to where it would best to send it to. And that's an ongoing work. I don't want to spend any time on this, but of course we know we've talked about the, the, the importance of scripture. So um, behind all of our giving, there is scriptural exhortation, isn't there, for each one of us. And we've often been taught that we ought to give to the Lord and to give regularly and proportionately and willingly and cheerfully and so on. And of course, in Philippians chapter number four, Paul again elevates it to a very high level. Perhaps sometimes when we were younger, um, we didn't quite appreciate that giving was something that the Lord took great knowledge of and great cognizance of. And of course, we've got the language of the altar and we're reminded that when we give, we're really giving as priests. And there in Philippians chapter 4, Paul talks about it rising as an odour of a sweet savour unto God himself. And that just elevates isn't it? the whole thought of giving to the Lord. So we're aware of the giving scripturally, but what about practically? And I suppose the question is, why, why use LWT at all? Well, there's a number of reasons, and I've put some of them down there. Um, it's efficient to do that, particularly if you're sending abroad, but even in the UK, and we'll think about the split just in a moment or two to give you a better feel, very efficient. The ladies there in particular are very, very experienced, and they're able very quickly and effectively using different banking channels to get funds out to the Lord's servants. Now that can be quite difficult. You take a country like Sri Lanka even, which we do a lot of work with and a lot of uh, close work with, and Egypt, very difficult to get funds into these countries easily. Um, you've got to be cognizant of the regulations that are involved and we're able to do that because of the experience that we've built up over many, many years. So that's one reason. And as I say, it's very effective. Now, not all the saints as they give will earmark, them, earmark their gifts. Um, some may decide that they'll give it and say, well, the trustees and the other ET should be able to uh, decide where that money would be best placed to meet need. Um, so that's another thing to, to think about because there's constant communication with missionaries in various parts of the world were then uh, aware of the needs of the saints and were then able to try and meet that need as best we possibly can through the help and exercise of the Lord's people. There's benefits of scale just because of the amount of funds that are going out then it's easier to do it in large sums than to do it on an individual basis. I wanted just to touch primarily on these Next two points. There's no expense deductions. Now, maybe some are thinking, well, surely there's a, an L of top slicing that if I send in my £100 or my £10, that one of those £10 or 10 of those £100 will be taken up for expenses. So uh, we can confirm that no deduction is made whatsoever from any gift that is given to us. There are no expense deductions. Expenses are very low in any case. It's worth pointing that out. Um, I've had some involvement with other charities uh, over the years, and some charities uh, can have expenses as high as 30 to 40 percent, and even some Christian charities can have expenses between 10 and 20 percent. Um, but the expense uh, level for LWT is probably between 2 and 3 percent, but that is not met from gifts that are given uh, for the Lord's work um, that are earmarked to go out to, to missionaries. There is no deductions made from them at all. Um, and then there is 
this thing called Gifted, and I'm sure many of you are aware of it. Um, but just in a moment, I just want to run through an example because some of you may not be aware of this as an advantage because Elder Beauty is a charity. It is an advantage in giving uh, money through Elder Beauty if you are a taxpayer. And then worth just again stressing that it's entirely, everything is entirely confidential. So you're able to uh, come to us confidentially um, and you can give confidentially. Um, you can even give through us confidentially so we don't even know who has given or it may be that you're happy for LWT and for the ladies to know but nobody else and the uh, Lord's servants don't know. Uh, we're able to work in all and any of these ways but confidentially is very, very important. So a number of practical reasons why people would use LWT. I mentioned gift aid and I just want to uh, touch on that now. Introduced many, many years ago, over 30 years ago, by the government, and it allows charities to claim by its basic rate of tax. So, um, at the moment, certainly in Wales and in England, it's 20%. We always like to do things a bit differently in Scotland, but let's just stick with Wales and England, uh, where we've got a basic rate of tax at 20%. Um, See, it only applies if you pay tax, it's not just income tax, actually. Um, if you pay corporation tax, it applies to that as well. But if you're a taxpayer um, and you've already paid the tax, then um, any charity and LWT is no exception are able to reclaim it. So, for example, for example, given there, Mrs. Weston, let's assume she's a basic rate taxpayer in Wales, kindly gives LWT a gift of £100. LWT can claim back the £25 she was already paid in tax. Now that's a great advantage, a great benefit. Um, perfectly legitimate, perfectly legal. In fact, some of you remember, may remember that many, many years ago, um, a good brother, Stephen Arbuthnot, who before he retired was an accountant by profession, he wrote an article in the Believer's Magazine on this subject, on gift aid and how it was legitimate. Because I think some brethren perhaps thought that some tax wheeze or dodge and uh, he was at great pains to stress that it wasn't. And maybe it's worthwhile just resurrecting that article and uh, putting it in the magazine again. But it is entirely uh, legal um, <clears throat> and, it's a, it's a, and it's very, very beneficial to have that uplift. And of course, if you um, are a higher rate taxpayer, if Mrs. Weston was a higher rate taxpayer, she could actually claim another £25 back because that's taxes she would have paid anyway, um, she's able to claim another a further £25 back to her tax return. So that's what gift aid is. Very simple, very easy to administer in many ways, and certainly simple from the donor's point of view. If you're giving money, it just requires one form to be completed. And then when the tax comes back, and it usually does so very quickly, you can also allocate that either to the same person or to a different person, very, you have that flexibility to gift aid, something that's very, very important. I just say we'd come back to the picture, and we're just going to touch briefly on letters. And I'm sure some, maybe some of the younger ones who are uh, on the Zoom call this evening are saying, letters in 2021, surely not. When was the last time you wrote a letter? Well, that might be a typical day's mail coming in to Kilmarnock. And it's still the case that we get many, many letters and many checks. So although that many of you will do all your banking on your mobile phone and just hover it over um, a little machine in the shops and you never ever have to even take a card out now and certainly never have to take cash out and never have to pay a check, that is not the way that a lot of the Lord's people still operate. So we do get letters in and we get checks in and we have to deal with them. Not the letters coming in, but letters going out. I mentioned that, that we do seek to encourage uh, the Lord's servants. So when gifts are sent out, we do send a month letter out as well, just to try and encourage them from the scriptures. So letters come in and letters go out. I mentioned also publications, look in the fields is one of those publications, which I'm sure many of you have seen and get. Um, 
although not so really recently, certainly not in printed form. Um, but just to stress, although we're not printing it just now, and I'll explain that in a minute, it is on the website. So um, the Lord's Work Trust website, if you go under newsletters over the right hand side, uh, scroll down, you'll be able to get the latest one uh, and be able to print it off. So they all are there, the April um, version is on and uh, you're able to go down through the month and read interesting letters that have come back to us from missionaries from the Lord's servants. Now, why has it not been printed just now? Well, one of the reasons early on, of course, was when lockdown happened, uh, the printer shut and it wasn't possible to print. And also it was very difficult uh, to get material out, even if we had managed to print it somewhere else, uh, to get it out and get it circulated when everybody was uh, staying at home. Now, obviously these circumstances have changed, but what we've decided to do is just to use the opportunity to refresh the look in the fields. Um, I just wanted to share this with you. Uh, very few have actually seen this, the trustees have, um, only briefly, but we're looking just to uh, possibly change it to something like that going forward, or maybe even something like that going forward. Um, likely to be an A5 size, but there will be changes coming soon, so you can look out for those. And it will be printed again, and it will be circulated again, but of course it will still be on the website. So look in the field to something where we're able to share um, the news that comes from uh, the mission field and has been happening for many, many years and still is a very useful way of communicating. Not the only way, and we'll touch on that as well, because I think a younger generation get their news feeds in a very different way. So that's one of the challenges that the trustees face and that we all face just in trying to keep abreast of these changes and keep us up to date as we possibly can. But as a stress, look in the fields will still be available. There's currently seven trustees and we meet quarterly. At the moment we're meeting virtually. Um, and even going forward, I think we might still do some of our meetings virtually, very convenient for the trustees and for myself. Um, and we'll get the secretary and the office staff. Now, just so that you know who these individuals are, James Brown, Peter Head, Andrew Green Belfast, Jeremy Hollifield, our chairman uh, this evening, from Derry Raymond, McNair, Glenn Alistair Sinclair, Cross House, Gordon Stewart, Wallingford, Stephen Trimble, Bally Keel. So there's the seven trustees. Then the ladies that really keep the whole thing moving, Mary Armstrong and Anne Wade, and then myself at the bottom. Now, strangely, I haven't a group photo of the trustees. I just realised that, that I didn't have one uh, of them, but I do have some pictures in slightly different surroundings. Now, I know that we've just talk, touched on looking in the fields, um, but it's not quite, I think, what we had in mind when we took that picture there. Um, it's almost guess who the trustees are, four of them. And uh, they seem to have some impact on... Uh, those in the field because suddenly the people, in the, the, the animals in the field are showing far more interest now. Um, and then James Brown from Peterhead, he's getting up close and personal with his horse. Then there's a picture of Jeremy himself. It's almost begging for captions, isn't it, really? Um, but I'd hasten to add that in working with these dear brethren over the last year and a half, it has been a joy. Um, and to see their interest and their encouragement and their enthusiasm and their support, it certainly made my um, job there so much easier. Um, and it's, it's just so, so good to have them and to bounce ideas off them. So we do appreciate very much their involvement in the work of the Lord and in the Lord's work trust as trustees. Numerically, just to give you some idea of some of the numbers uh, involved. So in the last year, 
uh, just over nine million pounds has been given out from Lords of Trust <clears throat> to over 1,300 different beneficiaries, different individuals who have received money sent directly from uh, Kilmarnock and sent to them. A staggering number actually, and that has increased dramatically during the last year. Now, lockdown would have had some um, bearing on that, but not entirely. Uh, and we're very grateful to the Lord that over what we thought would have been a very, very difficult period, and a year when a lot of the Lord's people found it difficult employment-wise and so on, that the um, Lord has exercised individuals and assemblies to continue to put support through LWT for the Lord's servants at home and abroad. 20% of that goes out to assemblies. 20% <clears throat> goes to home workers. 45% is sent to missionaries and medical work. And the remaining 15% for schoolwork, camps, Bible exhibitions, and publications. So hopefully that gives you a feel in terms of the numbers of the funds that are coming in and being distributed by the trust and by the trustees and where those funds uh, are going. I thought it was worthwhile just mentioning as well, just in connection with that, the geography, the spread, the scope of LWT. And again, this might surprise some of you. So 55% goes to the UK, to the Lord's servants, people and projects that they're involved in. And of course, that means the remaining 45% goes abroad, but distributed widely to over 70 countries and and increasing each year. 35% to South America, 30% to Africa, 15% to Asia, 20% to Europe, North America, and Australia. So I wanted to give some examples now. We've talked about it, um, the fact that we have involvement with uh, servants of the Lord in various parts of the world. Um, I know Eric's brother Alistair obviously is in South Africa, but slightly north of that, just wanted to touch on Angola. <clears throat> now, of course, uh, our forebears would have told us that uh, you're reading, writing, and arithmetic with the three R's um, that were the bedrock of, of school activity. And I'm sure that is the case in Africa as well, but there's another three R's that really is very, very difficult to talk about in UK educational establishment, UK schools, but it's quite straightforward in places like Angola. Of course, those three R's are man's ruin, God's remedy, and man's responsibility. Very difficult to raise that in our school environment. But over in Angola, freedom to tell young people about the Lord Jesus, which is a great privilege, a great benefit. So Brian and Debbie Howden, I'm sure most will know of them, who have spent many years in Angola, made an exercise to build a school. And there was a school under construction in Angola. And there's the school finished. What a beautiful building it is. Tanam Dambala is the school and it's finished. And of course, look inside, not only is it a lovely building, but here we've got these energetic, enthusiastic young primary children in a very colorful classroom and they're enjoying learning. It's tremendous to see that. And that was the vision of Brian and Debbie and others. And the trust was significantly involved in that particular project. Then the slightly older children, secondary school age, and again, what potential in these young lives as they learn and hopefully life skills that will enable them to get jobs and so on, but as they're also taught the scriptures and memorize the word of God and learn about the Lord Jesus. 
great possibilities there, hope for the future. That's Angola. And as I say, the trusts were significantly involved in that project. Asia. I mentioned Sri Lanka earlier on. And since the tsunami in particular, the trusts have had a, a significant involvement with Sri Lanka. Now, over the last year in particular, it's been very difficult because of the COVID-19. Um, people there, their employment just tends to be on a daily basis. So if there's no employment, they're not earning. And if they're not earning, they're not eating. So lockdown has had a dramatic effect on many people on the island of Sri Lanka. There is no safety net. There is no furloughing scheme. And as it says there, the feedback was that they were more likely to die from malnutrition and starvation than from the virus. So we have been able to help them. And a lot of people have been very exercised about this. And significant funds have been sent to Sri Lanka and to other countries like them. And one thing I would say is that it's amazing how diligent, not only are they in dealing with the funds, but in accounting for the funds. I think it's very reassuring that the, their stewardship of the funds is, is very, very good. And they're able to give us a detailed report of every penny and every pound that has been sent to them. It's the same in India. It's the same in other parts of the world as well. So we're very grateful for that and reassured by that. And as I say, but life is very difficult in Sri Lanka. So here's the Gospel Hall in Colombo, I think. Eric's been there, so he will be able to correct me if I'm wrong. But some of the foodstuffs that have been bought to alleviate some of the difficulties that the local believers and others have been facing. So bags of milk, flour, and soap. And that's getting distributed very diligently, very enthusiastically by the believers in Sri Lanka. Now, I don't know any of these sisters, but when I saw that picture and it was sent to me, I couldn't help but thinking of Acts 9 and wonder just if we could just call them all Dorcas. Because if you remember Dorcas in Acts 9, she was full of good works, which she did. And here's these dear sisters and they're working tirelessly in helping others in the island of Sri Lanka. Here's a dear man, um, hard work lifting these heavy bags and loading them onto the back of this lorry for distribution throughout the island. But willing to do it, he's working for the Lord, you see, and that is motivating him and energizing him. And it is hard graph, but what a benefit to his fellow believers. It's interesting, we sent funds out on a Friday. And just to give you an idea, the funds had arrived and some of the funds had been used and pictures were getting sent back of the start of the delivery on the Saturday. They were able to get a lorry filled and out on the Saturday and pictures were coming through within 24 hours. And that just shows the diligence of the saints out there in Sri Lanka. This is an area, if you look in the latest look in the field, you'll find a very interesting account that came back from the brethren in Colombo about the work here in Kurunagela, based on literature, based on Emmaus work, and there was an assembly established, new believers saved, people coming out of the denominations, uh, but they didn't have a hall. And we were able to help a little, and literally again, within just a few weeks of the funds being sent out, uh, the buildings taking shape. And like Nehemiah, they were rising up to build. Further pictures come back just a few weeks later. The walls are up, the roof's on, and the electrics are going in. And it's nice to see that there's some insulation and some of the cables. Now, the ladder, uh, it's not the kind that you would buy out of B&Q or Wix, but improvisation is required in Sri Lanka, and they get the job done, and the hall is almost completed and ready to be used. What a blessing, as these dear people will gather in that new hall 
to remember the Lord Jesus and to witness and to preach the gospel and to influence others in that difficult land. Many pressures, not only COVID pressures, but many other significant pressures and problems that they face on a daily basis. Persecution that we really know nothing about here, but the Lord is using them, the Lord is blessing them, and the work is growing in Sri Lanka, and it's good just to be involved in that. Very briefly, I'm almost finished. Potentially. We've alluded to the fact that uh, some of the practices, some of the processes um, are still quite old fashioned in many ways, but necessary. But we're conscious that we can't stay that way forever. So uh, we are seeking to improve quite significantly banking access. Uh, as I say, our young people just use their phones and hopefully going forward quite soon, some of that, that facility will be available in giving through Lord's Work Trust. And also social media. Again, there's maybe some older believers in the call and they're saying, well, don't really know anything of this. Um, but for our younger people, that's the world that they live in. And perhaps they would prefer to have a report in Sri Lanka and be able to download it onto their phone and to read it on the way to work or on the way to university. Um, so these symbols will mean more to them than it means to you and I probably, but uh, Facebook and Twitter and so on. Um, and hopefully during the remainder of this year, God willing, um, we'll look to try and develop some um, work in relation to social media. One slide left, I think. You know, it's a wonderful joy for any of us just to be involved in the Lord's work. We're all involved in it. We were thinking about that earlier in relation to these two verses at the end of 1 Corinthians. There's a joy associated with serving Christ. And certainly over the last year and a half, perhaps that's the one word that would summarize the activity. Um, there's a joyfulness about it. These dear believers in difficult circumstances, and yet when you speak to them or they write to you or they email you or they text you, there's just a joy filling their hearts as they're serving the Lord Jesus. Often, as I mentioned, in old age, and yet they're still doing so with enthusiasm. But they're not all old. I had the privilege of being at this young couple's commendation meeting in Scotland <clears throat> just before COVID. And it was a joy to be there, I can assure you. It was a wild Saturday night. And I, took, I drove down 120 miles. But what a blessing to be there. And they're now out serving the Lord with their little family, Daniel and Abigail. And I got a picture yesterday from Craig. And he's got an exercise about some of the rural villages in... <clears throat> Southwest Scotland, no assembly testimony, no evangelical witness, and they both would like just to spread the gospel, tell others of the Lord Jesus, just right there. And uh, he's got exercise about having a portable hall, one that's transportable. So yesterday morning, he sent me a picture of a trailer that he's now just acquired, and soon he'll have the two sections of the portable hall that can go in the back of it, and they'll be able to take it round once regulations ease to some of these villages. Pray for Craig and Christina, pray for the little family, pray for others like them who do have that vision uh, and they're at the younger end of the age spectrum and they've got enthusiasm and energy. I uh, do pray for them that they'll be preserved, that they'll be used, that they'll be blessed. And I say it's a joy just to work with them and to help them wherever we can. Remember, those serving the Lord in this country, it's been a challenging year, but do you remember those serving in these difficult trouble spots of the world. Some of them quite inaccessible in many ways, and yet they're still serving Christ in Lebanon and Yemen and so on. And it's wonderful just to see the courage of the believers, men and women who are committed to the things of the Lord Jesus and who are serving him energetically. And they are serving him unitedly, passionately, devotedly. And as they do continue to pray for him. Pray for those involved in Lord's Watch Trust. Remember the ladies in particular. At the moment, they're just going in one, uh, one each every day uh, until the restrictions ease up. But as they were grateful that throughout the whole period of COVID, we've been able to still continue to uh, get funds out to the Lord's servants without any delay in any month. And for that, we're very, very grateful. Would you trust that this overview of the work of the Lord's Work Trust, some of its history, some of the current activity, some of the predicted plans, 
those involved, that it will just help you to pray more intelligently for the work and for the Lord's servants. Let's hand back to Jeremy.